everyone, and welcome to this cyber seminar series, Hydrologic Science and Indigenous Voices. Quasi is excited to host this series alongside River Bites LLC founder, Dr. Mary Beth Niffen. And before I hand things off to our speakers for today, I wanted to give a brief overview of Kawazi while folks are still logging on and getting settled. Um, here we go. Sorry. <laughs> My name is Lisa Muchichito, and I am the Community Outreach Specialist for Kawazi. And Kawazi is the Consortium of Universities for the Advancement of Hydrologic Science, Inc. And we are a nonprofit organization funded in part by the National Science Foundation. And our mission is to advance water science by strengthening interdisciplinary collaboration, providing critical infrastructure through our data services, and promoting education and water science at all levels. And we seek to fulfill this mission in two main ways, and that is through our data services and our community services. Kawazi Data Compute Services provide tools and support the entire data lifecycle from data discovery to collaboration to publication. Kawazi hosts two data repositories um, that, and sorry, those are HydroShare and HIS, also known as data.kawazi.org. And the hope is that by providing the support and infrastructure, Kawazi can help researchers formulate and execute their data management plans be effective data stewards and meet the requirements of funding agencies. And on the other side of our organization is our community services. And these include, um, we have grants and fellowship opportunities. We have workshops and we have a summer institute with the National Water Center for graduate students. We have events and a webinar series such as the one we're having right now. We have a virtual university program and a guest lecture database. Kawazi seeks to be a resource for the water science community as a whole. And there are a number of community meetings coming up soon, including two meetings that we will be exhibiting at, the ModFlow and More Conference happening at Princeton and the Frontiers in Hydrology meeting, which is co-sponsored by AGU and Kawazi. And I wanted to add a mention, if anyone is planning to attend the Frontiers in Hydrology meeting, Mary Beth is moderating a workshop called Ideation Through Art to Create Inclusive Futures, Transforming the Vision of Climate Change, Hydrology, and Failure. So if you're interested, be sure to sign up for that. So we have a lot going on and always um, we've got more announcements coming out. So we'll have more webinars and workshops happening later this summer and the fall. So I would encourage you to visit our recently updated website. You can sign up for our newsletter. You can join our community Slack channel um, just to stay up to date and learn more, to, more about Kwasi. Um, I also be posting links to some of these things in the chat momentarily. But before we get started, just a few logistical things. This webinar is being recorded and we uh, will be posting it on our Kwasi YouTube channel later. Secondly, we ask that you use the Q&A functionality to submit questions for our speakers. And finally, we expect that all involved with Kawazi Cyber Seminars uphold the Kawazi Code of Conduct and promote and maintain a professional, considerate, respectful, and collaborative virtual environment. And thank you again for joining this webinar. And thank you, Dr. Mary Beth Niffen and to Kenny Swiftbird for your presentation and providing this opportunity for engagement. And we're very excited to have you. So with that, I will let Mary Beth take it away. Oh, you're on mute, Mary Beth. Great, thank you so much. So I just wanna thank you all for being here and Welcome you to this event, Hydrologic Science and Indigenous Voices, a cyber seminar series. I'm your host, Mary Beth Niffin, a hydrogeologist and the vice chair of the Diversity, Equity and Inclusion Standing Committee for Kwasi. This committee has been supporting the development of the Kwasi Code of Conduct and developing a charter for the DEI Standing Committee. Uh, as Lisa mentioned, we'll be hosting an informal conversation at the Frontiers of Hydrology Conference held in 
June, um, June 19th through 24th, 2022 in San Juan, Puerto Rico. I invite you to join the conversation in person or online. We're gonna make um, online available. And if you're interested in that event, um, please watch out on the Kwasi website. And you, you're also welcome to email me as well as I'll be organizing the event. Um, and I will provide my email in the chat. Um, I'm also the co-founder of River Bites LLC, a small business dedicated to placing groundwater concepts in the global vernacular through education, community-based collaborative modeling and citizen science. Through my volunteer work with this organization, I've been collaborating with speakers to organize this series today. In addition, I will be teaching an upcoming workshop that Lisa mentioned on merging art into the scientific process, incorporating creativity into science. We will be painting our way into a resilient and sustainable future. Um, so for more information on this, please stay tuned on my, uh, the business website, which I will also provide in the chat. Um, the purpose of this Hydrologic Science and Indigenous Voices series is to highlight Indigenous voices and ways of knowing, expanding the definition of hydrologic science to be more inclusive. The six-week cyber seminar series features five individuals working in or alongside hydrologic sciences and who identify as indigenous. The series takes us on a journey through a variety of geographic spaces and the hearts and minds of those occupying those spaces. We start in the center of North American continent in Oklahoma, which we talked about last week. And this week we are traveling to Colorado. In future weeks, we'll be going to Wisconsin, Arizona and end in Louisiana. Throughout the series, speakers explore how hydrologic sciences are defined and who is included in those definitions. We def discussed how Native American people relate to water, what water issues are important for us to reflect on as a hydrologic sciences community, and how we can increase inclusivity in the hydrologic sciences, including what challenges and opportunities we face as scientists and community members when finding resilient solutions to water challenges and climate change. This series, as mentioned, is being recorded and will be freely available through the Kwasi website, um, which we will provide. Um, I don't know if it's available yet, but it will be soon, if not. And uh, again, if you're interested in that follow-up information, please um, uh, either follow Kawasi's website or follow River Bites website because that's where we will post that information. Our hope is that the recordings can be used in undergraduate and graduate hydrologic sciences courses to inspire and inform ongoing discussions. I wanted to say a little bit about my inspiration for hosting this series as it stems from my, uh, my beliefs that hydrologic science as a discipline and hydrologic sciences as a community will benefit from having people with diverse perspectives, ways of knowing and worldviews in the discipline of hydrology. I believe that scientific process of inquiry is at its core a process of integrity to better understand the complexities and intricacies of our world and betterment of hydrologic science. I acknowledge that there's been a culture of practice that allows people of certain backgrounds and worldviews advantages when, in finding, when finding belonging in hydrology and when advancing their careers. I acknowledge as a culture in the United States, we've treated people poorly and there's a long history of physical, psychological and emotional violence toward black, indigenous and people of color. In the development of the organizations that I am familiar with over the last several hundred years, the history of violence and scarcity is devastatingly common. One way that we can vastly improve the rigor of science is to reflect on the practice of science and how science, scientific inquiry aids individual and collective understanding of societal challenges occurring in real time. I want to emphasize the importance of distinguishing science as a process of inquiry from science as a worldview. I believe that people from many different worldviews and value systems have a keen ability to practice the process of scientific inquiry and improve the rigor 
of hydrologic science as we know it. To put this in context, human history dates back much longer than several hundred years. The period of time that most of us or the dominant narrative um, are, are familiar with. Societies that lived prior to these periods had different ways of organizing and communicating that are only just starting to be recognized in the dominant scientific narrative. I believe that the people that carry on the traditions of these ways and knowing, communicating and communicating need to be honored, celebrated and supported for their gifts and offered appropriate positions so that we can learn from these vast histories of knowledge, in many cases, not widely told in dom dominant scientific narratives, finding ways to include practices of justice, equity, diversity and inclusion into our cultural practice of science is the way forward. From my perspective, it is not a threat to our present ways of knowing and understanding. Rather, including justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion adds rigor, expertise, value, depth, meaning, and purpose to hydrologic science. These are the reasons why I'm inspired to host this Kwasi series, Hydrologic Science and Indigenous Voices. While I don't identify as indigenous to this land and its history for thousands of years, I identify as being belonging to the full spectrum of the community of people of this land. I greatly value what I've learned from indigenous communities, have great gratitude for the trust that they've granted me despite historical acts of violence of white people. I see Native American communities, sovereign communities, having vast strength, skills, and expertise. I see the value and strength of hydrology as a discipline. I see how the hydrologic sciences can be even better. That betterness will emerge from justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion, and us as a hydrologic science community getting to know and understand what these concepts mean and how they impact the scientific questions we ask, our frameworks and methodologies for answering those scientific questions and the practices, policies, and procedures for who we are including in the present and future of this discipline. With that, I thank you so much for being interested in this series and to a deeper inquiry into what justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion means for us as a community of scientists, us as individual scientists, and us as individuals who are part of the human community. I'm grateful for your presence today Thank you for listening. Thank you for reflecting. Uh, throughout the series, I invite you to think about what could be tangible outcomes of this event to make the space of hydrologic sciences more welcoming to diverse ways of knowing, being, and understanding. If you're interested in follow-up action and being part of creating a more inclusive community, please subscribe to the listserv at riverbites.com and I'll provide the link in the chat or send an email to info at riverbites.com. And with that, today we have the pleasure and honor to speak with Kenny Swift Bird. Kenny Swift Bird is an Ogallala Lakota tribal member, a Gates Millennium Scholar from the Bill and Gates, Melinda Gates Foundation, and a PhD student at the Colorado School of Mines. His interest in hydrogeology and geoscience more broadly was sparked by water contamination and water scarcity issues on the Pine Ridge Reservation in South Dakota, his tribal homelands where most of his family still lives. His MS thesis work focused on delineating spatial and geochemical controls of arsenic and uranium in groundwater on the Pine Ridge Reservation. And he is currently involved with a water sampling campaign on the Navajo Nation through the AGU Thriving Earth Exchange. He's working to become an expert on metal and metalloid faint and transport in streams and aquifer sister systems to address metal and metalloid impacts on tribal lands and within other marginalized communities. So thank you so much, Kenny, for being here with us today. Can you please start by uh, describing how your culture has shaped your view of water? Yeah, so good morning, everyone. And thank you, Mary Beth, for the introduction. 
Um, so my name is Kenny Swifford. I'm an Oglala Lakota tribal member and recently a hydrology PhD candidate at Colorado School of Mines, which has been a pleasant uh, development since when I submitted that bio. Um, so really my interest in hyd hydrology, hydrogeology, and the reason I'm in graduate school today stems from water issues on the Pine Ridge Reservation, which is the home to my tribe, the Oglala Sioux tribe, where most of my family still lives. Um, in Lakota, we really have an oral tradition. Our knowledge, culture, and stories have been passed down uh, by stories through the millennia. I'm really thankful for the elders I've had in my life from my grandmother, dad, aunts and uncles, um, and other people who have helped me live, learn the culture. And I'm gonna do my best to pass that down again here today. Um, and to answer, the story, answer how culture has shaped my view of water, um, I'm gonna start with the Lakota creation story. Um, for my people, in the beginning, uh, Wakan Tonka, which is Lakota for the great spirit or creator, existed in nothingness. Um, the spirit was alone and engulfed in darkness. So he split part of himself into four great spirits for company and companionship. The first uh, way he split himself was into what's known as Heon, who is a massive, all-powerful, being that was so strong that nothing could exist except for Eon. Um, Eon realized his omnipotence and power and focused his energy into an orb. He focused his energy so tightly that he bled dry and hardened into stone. And all of the energy released and was blue and it was actually water. Eon is the god of rock. And Eon created Unshi Maka, or what we call Grandmother Earth. Eon's hardened skin makes up the surface of the earth and Eon's blood is the water that makes up the ocean, streams, rivers, groundwater, and everything we study as hydrologists. Eon sacrificed himself to build the earth as we know it. Um, and eventually as creation progressed, the sky and sun were created, which made up the four principal beings um, with all of them being separate and powerful and all a part of Wakan Tonka, the great spirit. So that's kind of where our view on water stems from. And the importance and sacredness of water is evidence in our Anibi or sweat lodge, uh, one of our most important spiritual ceremonies. If you're not familiar with the sweat lodge, it's a ceremony where we go and pray and connect with the great spirit. Uh, we heat volcanic rocks, typically things like basalt, um, really a small piece of eon and a large fire until they're white hot. We bring them into a lodge and pour water onto the rocks. Uh, the rocks are so hot, the water boils instantly and releases a lot of heat and steam that purifies the lodge and starts our ceremony. And that steam actually serves as our physical connection to the Great Spirit. Because of water, we become one with Wakan Tonka during the sweat lodge. Um, if you go all the way back to really the beginning of time, the Lakota people um, have been known as the bison or Tatanka people in our language. Um, our lives were really centered around hunting bison herds and spiritual ceremonies that brought us um, to the center of our universe, the Black Hills in South Dakota. Um, we believe that the bison are part of our, Oyat our Oyate, or people. And before a hunt, warriors would pray for hours, thanking the Great Spirit for the sacrifices of, of our brothers and sisters. And practically every part of the bison's body was used by my ancestors. Uh, we really lived in harmony with the bison and believed that for the Lakota nation to be strong, the Buffalo nation needed to be strong. And some of our oldest legends tell us that the bison will lead us to water and water will lead us to the bison. So traditionally, we always camped in river valleys where we were never, never far away from water or bison. Um, we were and still are the bison people, um, but the bison really in, existed with water in an integrated web. Uh, one of our oldest terms is Miniwachoni, which means water is life, uh, because water is always provided and sustained for us. It's our first medicine. It's really a living being, and Wakan Tonka, the great spirit, flows through water. So from our very creation, water has always been sacred. It's our connection to Wakan Tonka and spiritual ceremonies, and water has always been and will always be life for us in our, in our first medicine. Thank you so much for sharing all of that. It's um, really important context and for a way of understanding um, how your, your culture has shaped your worldview. 
And I'm wondering how, how has your worldview then shaped your understanding of water and the way you study water? Yeah, so all of that culture, all of those stories and recognizing water as a sacred and living being is something that's really been ingrained into me by my elders um, for as long as I can remember. I'm lucky to have grown up with them in my life and shared those stories. Um, and along those lines, one of my, probably my favorite concept in Lakota is this idea of mitakuye oyasen, which it, it really doesn't translate very well to English, but I'll do my best to explain it. So mitakuye oyasen would literally translate to something like blessings to all my family or everything is connected. So like at, at a surface level, it kind of sounds like something you would say before a holiday meal or a, a gathering with family. But the ideology and meaning behind Mitaku Yeo Yasin really goes much, much deeper than that. Um, for Lakota people, we believe that we're related to really everything that exists on Uchimakam, Grandmother Earth. And the Great Spirit connects everything from humans to animals and plants and everything that we share the world with to the earth and rock and water beneath our feet to the sky and birds that live above us. So there's really a harmony or balance that exists between all things in nature. Everything is connected and we believe that nothing can thrive unless every being is healthy, healthy and thrive, thriving. Um, I think it's a really incredible concept that's also scientifically accurate and shows that my ancestors have essentially been experts in sustainability, ecology, conservation, and preservation. Um, really just living in harmony with, with the land for millennia. And I'm incredibly thankful that they've passed down those knowledge and insights through the generations. I think Western science really tends to separate humanity from nature. And this shows in almost all of the scientific conceptual models I've ever seen. I know like if you look at Google, the classic kind of hydrologic cycle diagram, it shows water fluxes in a pristine environment. There's, there's usually a mountain or an ocean or these other like, you know, beautiful pieces of nature somewhere. And there's rarely any mention of the ways that humans have altered the hydrologic cycle. And I mean, here in America and really throughout the entire modernized world, we've dammed and commodified nearly every major river that exists. We've disturbed the earth to extract, I mean, an incredible amount of resources, things like metals, oil and natural gas, and we've also had to upscale agriculture to support nearly 8 billion people. Um, and along with that, as we've industrialized and developed, we've left mountains of trash and pollution in our wake. Um, I think climate change also threatens to disrupt the natural harmony and balance of our world. And all of these things disrupt and um, our concept of mitaku yeo yasin, that natural balance and harmony that's always existed really until the dawn of the industrial era and the start of colonialism. So I think many of these scars of industrialism and colonialism have a pronounced impact on present day tribal communities. Dams and agricultural pollutant, pollution in the Pacific Northwest um, are a huge threat on salmon populations that indigenous people have relied on for millennia. Most reservations in the, in the United States are in the arid West where um, farming is difficult or basically straight up infeasible. Um, climate change threatens further aridification, uh, which has all kinds of implications for water supplies, wildfire risks, and um, the continued health of native and indigenous animal and plant species. Um, as I mentioned before, for Lakota people, we believe that water is a living being. And many, many elders I've talked to will say that these issues have fundamentally altered the spirit of water. Um, and so I think these concepts, this mitaku yeo yasin, and really the balance that exists is something that I try to, um, it's always been a part of my life and it's something that I, is part of why I got into water. Um, I, <clears throat> I grew up in an area that has a lot of arsenic and uranium. Um, and it was a huge issue where Many people on the Pioneers Reservation were fearful of contaminants in their water, didn't know what was there, but there really hadn't been much study to address it. Um, and that was really what sparked my interest. I had seen, 
I think there was one study from USGS that noted that there is a lot of arsenic and uranium and there should be further study. Some work from the local tribal college, Oglala Lakota College, um, but really nothing else being done. Um, and I think that's a big part of why I ended up in hydrogeology and geosciences more broadly is I saw geosciences as a tool to address some of these impacts where I grew up and where people are still struggling with uh, water quality and water security. Um, so I think my culture has kind of shaped me and brought me into geosciences as I realized that uh, geoscience is a way to hopefully heal these areas, address water quality and scarcity impacts, and um, ultimately bring these natural systems closer to the harmony that they've always existed, existed in traditionally. I think you're muted. Sorry, Mary Beth, you're on mute. <laughs> oh, thank you. Um, sorry. So what I was saying was uh, growing up and seeing all these different ways of, you know, that the that the environment has been impacted, the contaminants, um, and knowing, you know, how the, how the worldview of growing up with your elders has really shaped your understanding. And then seeing that geoscience is a way to address some of these issues, how do you now interact with and study water in your research and your work? Yeah, so I'll see for this section, I'll see if I can share some slides, just one second. Great. And as he's doing that, um, listeners, if you wanna put any questions, if questions come up as, as you're listening, please put them in the, the Q in the Q and A, and we will um, get to them uh, quarter quarter to the hour. Yeah. So really, um, kind of my work now stems from the fact that for most people in the United States, safe drinking water is a luxury that we don't even think about. If you live in a developed area, through most of the United States. Accessing safe drinking water is as simple as walking to your kitchen, turning on your tap, and really not even thinking twice about um, where that water is coming from or what might be in it. Um, but that luxury is something that's not afforded to many indigenous communities. Um, there are statistics that say roughly 10% of indigenous people, uh, let's see if I can put this in presentation mode. Here we go. Um, roughly 10% of tribal homes across the United States actually lack access to safe drinking water. Here in 2022, people are still hauling water from a well that might be tens or, or dozens of miles away from where they live. Um, and that number can be as high as I think 30 or even 40% of people lack access to safe drinking water um, on the Pine Ridge Reservation where I grew up and in places like the Navajo Nation in the Four Corners area. Um, the challenges to access to safe and accessible drinking water for tribal communities uh, really stems to a lot of the policies that were enacted as part of the creation of reservation systems, colonialism, and land allotment that have split apart our reservations um, over, on, over a century ago now. Um, so the map on the right shows where uh, reservations are located throughout the United States, and they're almost predominantly in arid locations in the Western United States, with some exceptions in the East. Um, there's an incredibly low population density on tribal reservations. And one of the big reasons for this really stems back to actual policies from the 1800s. Uh, the Dawes General Allotment Act was passed in 1887. And it was basically an area of trying to forcefully convert Native Americans from their traditional ways of life into a Western agricultural society. And it basically said that every parcel of land was split across the reservation and given to a head of household in the spirit of um, turning our nomadic people in, at least nomadic on, for the Lakota people, into farmers. Um, and that didn't work, especially, as I mentioned, most of the reservations are in the arid west that 
where farming is somewhere between difficult and impossible. Uh, but on top of that, many of the lands that had soils that were actually amenable to agriculture were preferentially set aside and given to white settlers. So this allotment practi practice divided our reservations um, and also held aside a lot of the most productive land for non-natives. But many people are still holding on to their allotment land. I know my family still lives on the land that we've had um, in Wolf Creek, South Dakota, just east of Pine Ridge for over a century now. For a lot of people, it's all they have. It's all they know. And that's a big reason why um, people live so rurally and there's such a low population density. Um, and that becomes important when you start to think about things like how to put any kind of centralized water infrastructure into place when you might have one house every few square miles. Um, and there are also a number of water and treaty rights that um, through the Winters decision, uh, Native Americans were um, afforded, I think, over 2 million acre feet of water in the Colorado River Compact. Uh, but those rights have been, are, have struggled to be actually recognized and commodified uh, for people that live in the Colorado River Basin. So there's a number of challenges and reasons why um, there's a lack of access to safe drinking water. And it really stems to a lot of the policies and really the creation of reservation systems as we know it, which most of those decisions are now over a century old. Um, in terms of my work, I specifically focus on metals and tribal communities. This is a figure that um, I show pretty much all the time when I present on this subject um, from a really great paper from Johnny Lewis and some other folks at the University of New Mexico. Um, they did some spatial analysis and found um, some pretty mind-blowing figures that three-fourths of the abandoned uranium mines in the United States are within 70 or are within 50 miles or 80 kilometers of a tribal boundary. The figure on the right shows um, mining intensity and or density in the dark red color, and tribal communities are shown by the hatched colors. And it's really across the four corners in Arizona, a distinct correlation. Where I grew up in South Dakota, also a distinct correlation between uranium mining in tribal communities and really throughout the Pacific Northwest into Montana, Idaho, and Washington, there's this proximity between tribal communities and abandoned, abandoned mines. 20% um, of the abandoned mines are within 10 kilometers or six miles of reservation. And there's over half a million Native Americans that live within 10 kilometers of an abandoned mine. So for many of us, metals and metalloids in our drinking water is pretty much an unfortunate reality. Um, as I mentioned, for my master's study, I actually had the opportunity to go home to the Pine Ridge Reservation and essentially I'll attempt to distill my master's work into one slide, so we'll, we'll see how that works. Um, but for my master's work, I was actually able to collaborate with the Indian Health Service on the Pine Ridge Reservation, which had installed over 250 wells trying to get people access to drinking water across the reservation. So the map on the left, all of the triangles are areas where a well had been installed, and it's primarily within the Arikari Aquifer on the Pine Ridge Reservation. Um, one of the problems with the Arikari Aquifer is stratigraphically, it is connected to the White River Group, which is en enriched in volcanoclastic siltstone and bentonite. And one of the issues with these volcanoclastic sediments is um, there's a lot of ash in the White River Group, which acts as a regional source of both arsenic and uranium. So you have a uh, drinking water aquifer for many people directly underlain by ash deposits that source arsenic and uranium. And um, a study from the USGS had found something like, um, I think there was a study in the 1990s that said I think it was 30% of wells that were monitored on the Pine Ridge Reservation by the USGS failed an EPA MCL for arsenic uranium. The data set that I had suggested that 50% of groundwater on the Pine Ridge Reservation failed an EPA MCL, typically for arsenic uranium or gross alpha, which is basically a measure of radioactive decay in water. Um, and for my work, once I had access to this data set, it basically became um, an exercise in statistics and groundwater chemistry to try to pull apart the data set and understand the factors that were driving spatial patterns in contaminant levels, as well as geochemical factors that were 
um, influencing water quality. And we basically, with statistics, we identified kind of four major regions that essentially represented a flow path along the aquifer, which is shown um, in the figure to the right, going from the green triangle to the red triangle, where the further down gradient you were going, uh, essentially water became older and it looked like a residence time story where we had evidence of groundwater buffering with calcite, driving up pH and alkalinity, um, and also getting closer in source to that underlying um, metal source. So kind of a double-edged sword where residence time makes the water more amenable to leach contaminants, it seemed, because we had arsenic and uranium also increasing along the flow path and also getting closer in proximity to that underlying uh, regional source. So we divided these four groups together and it really came together into a residence time story. Um, and one of the scary things of this work was essentially three fourths of the wells that we had in this further down gradient region, which essentially represents the northern portion of the Pioneers Reservation spatially um, near, the, near the Badlands. If you've ever been to Badlands National Park or traveled through South Dakota, um, this down gradient section of the aquifer had basically a three fourths chance of failing an EPA MCL for arsenic, uranium, or, or gross alpha. Um, so this was pretty much a dream come true for me to be able to go home and study the problem that sparked my interest in hydrogeology in the first place. Um, and it was something that I was really excited. We actually had a chance to share these results back to the tribal council on Pine Ridge, as well as the Indian Health Service office. Um, so we had a chance to actually take our work back and present it to, to local stakeholders. In terms of my current work for my PhD, um, I'm working on assessing event scale metalloid fluxes from mining impacted catchments in Colorado. Um, it's work that's evolving pretty quickly and I'll be going out in the field in a couple weeks and hopefully having some interesting insights to share at the Frontiers Conference in a few weeks. Uh, but it's kind of actively evolving and I just finished up my first year. So it's really, really in its infancy in terms of that study. Um, I'm working in the Coal Creek watershed west of Crested Butte and the headwaters of the Animus River watershed near Silverton, Colorado to look at uh, metal fluxes in response to hydrologic events, whether that's snowmelt or uh, monsoon rains across kind of a gradient of historic legacy mining impacts. Um, and looking to use that gradient to parse, parse metal loading in response to different events under, under kind of a gradient of conditions. Um, and the other project that I've been involved with recently is actually a water sampling campaign, campaign down in the Navajo Nation in partnership with the AGU Thriving Earth Exchange. They're a group of folks that, um, it's actually a community-led project that uh, three leaders from different communities reached out to AGU because many people there don't have faith in their water systems, similar to Pine Ridge where I grew up. They don't know what's in the water. They know that there are metals around um, and many people just refuse to drink the water, only buy bottled water or things like that. So we're actually training local high school students to be our water samplers. Um, we're gonna collect, I think our goal is 10 water samples from each of the three communities to hopefully give people more faith in their drinking water systems or alternatively delineate areas with poor drinking water quality and um, work towards developing a remedy for those communities. So it's a really exciting project to be a part of. Um, it's really refreshing because there are no, none of the traditional pressures of academia or publishing are there. I get to show up to meetings, go down to the communities and use the tools that I've been to be a resource for them. Pretty much my first and only question is how can I help you? Not how can I turn this into a scientific publication or use this to benefit myself? Um, so I think it's a great example of reciprocity, and I'm really excited to see what comes out of it for both the communities and the high school students that we are training to be our water samplers. Um, so that's kind of an overview of the work that I've done for my master's and ongoing work that I have now um, in my PhD here at Colorado School of Mines. Those are some fascinating studies. Thank you so much for sharing um, the vast amount of work that you've covered in a short period of time. <laughs> Uh, and the work that you're doing with the Navajo Nation is a great way of expanding 
uh, hydrologic or hydrologic sciences community to the actual communities themselves. And I wonder if you have any other thoughts about how we can expand our hydrologic sciences community to evolve our, in our study of water. Yeah, so I think um, in terms of expanding the hydro hydrologic science community, um, I think there's been a lot of movement and work on interdisciplinary science in the last decade. And I'm really grateful to be a part of the Critical Zone Network, which brings together all kinds of brilliant people from different parts of the country and different disciplines to solve complex interdisciplinary problems. And I think that kind of work really ties back into that concept of Mitaku Yasin from earlier, this idea that everything is connected and designing studies to explore these connections is an evolution of geosciences. And I think in line with kind of traditional knowledge and values. Um, but I think as part of that, we really need to do better about incorporating diversity of thought and re recruiting geosciences from different backgrounds that um, bring in different thought processes and way of, ways of understanding the earth. Um, and in terms of indigenous communities, there are over 500 tribes in the United States. I've kind of given an overview of an incomplete and imperfect Lakota point of view that I've picked up from my lived experiences, but there's an incredible diversity of indigenous knowledge and ways of knowing that I think could offer solutions to many of the challenges that are facing geosciences today. Can you say more about that, about how we can expand and be more inclusive of broader worldviews in hydrologic sciences community? Like what would be a few examples or how would you approach that if you have any ideas? Yeah, I think in terms of the communities that I've worked with, I think a big part of that is respecting indigenous knowledge and, way, and ways of knowing. Um, as I've kind of alluded to, I think, you know, journals and scientific publications are great and a great way to disseminate knowledge among our community, but it's not the only way to disseminate knowledge. It, you know, something doesn't have to be in a high impact journal, journal to be meaningful and valuable. Um, one of the most incredible things that I've seen and I'm trying to build my knowledge and cultural understandings, I've met elders who can look at a stream bed or a field or whatever land they call home, maybe ancestrally or currently on a reservation, and they can pick out some small changes of you know, one plant that no longer grows or is, is new, or maybe notice that the cattle won't graze in a field anymore. And, and then they can also pretty, much, pretty confidently say that water has changed. Um, I've met elders, including my grandmother, who are pretty much experts at observational science, who have spent their entire life looking at connections and bonds that exist in nature. And for people like that, it becomes incredibly obvious to point out when things are changing or have shifted away from that natural equilibrium or harmony that exists. So I think there's incredible value in meaningful collaboration and partnerships with indigenous communities, uh, but many indigenous communities don't really trust scientists and other outsiders. You know, there's a long history of unethical practices, savior science, one-way communication, that's really not communication, in working with indigenous communities that makes many of them distrustful or skeptical of sciences. So I think there's, um, we have to fight against that long history of uneth unethical practices and mistrust um, in order to form meaningful collaborations. Yeah, so given, given that context, and, and the struggle and that, that history, how do you imagine that we would expand our study and the inclusivity of water to, to benefit indigenous communities and the hydrologic sciences community? How would you imagine that unfolding or envision that unfolding? Um, I think in order to develop truly collaborative relationships, it's, it's thinking of recipro reciprocity it's thinking for long-term relationships. And that might be a challenge in terms of kind of the traditional three-year project cycle that exists on like NSF projects. Um, it's really a commitment to work with these communities until their needs are, needs are met, really however long that takes. Um, and I think it's, it's working in reciprocity and finding ways, um, you know, academia is super competitive and it's easy to think in terms of like, what do I need to do to finish my PhD? What do I need to do to get tenure? What do I need to do to basically benefit myself? And it can be easy to fall into those thought processes, but I think you really have to go into those communities 
saying, how can we make this equally beneficial, if not more beneficial for this community? Um, how can I use my knowledge and experience to um, impact their daily lives? For a lot of these people, contaminated water or lack, lack to access of water altogether is a reality that they live. It's far more important, in my opinion, than you know, publishing in a scientific journal. And it's something that I think it's, it's really a long-term commitment in developing relationships um, and working in that reciprocity. So, and especially because, I mean, a lot of these issues, when you're looking at water insecurity, water quality, or food security, and the list could go on and on, these things will only be exacerbated or have already been exacerbated by climate change. So I think it's really a critical issue to solve by meaningful and um, meaningful and mutually beneficial collaborations with these communities that have kind of a long-term plan. Yeah, I, I really, I value what you said about needing, a, you know, the long-term approach to, to relationships and to these studies um, and just the valuing of that local knowledge and expertise. And so we have a few questions and I, I want to open it up to some questions from um, the attendees at this time. We have a few that have come in um, and a few people that, that have, have written comments to you. Kenny, your work is excellent and eye-opening and someone wants to follow up with you about a water equity workshop. Um, but in terms of questions, uh, one of the questions we've received is what are ways forward for the community after having assessed the scale of the problem? So clearly the map was, I, I, I see why you bring that map up every time, or every time you give presentations because it is very informative and shows this, the large scale of the problem. Um, do you have thoughts about our ways forward beyond what you've already said? Yeah, so there's actually, um, there is one of the, I think it's the largest rural water project in US history has already been completed to um, ideally solve water issues on the Pine Ridge Reservation. Congress passed the Mini Wachoni Act, I think it was in 1988, um, and it was essentially intended to be this holistic solution for water quality on the Pine Ridge Reservation. Um, they, there's actually a pipeline, they're funding for a pipeline that takes water from the middle part of the state of South Dakota near the capital in Pierre on the Missouri River and pipes it, I think 200, 250 miles to the Pine Ridge Reservation. Um, and that was kind of intended to be this holistic solution. And I think it took like two decades longer to complete than it was supposed to. It took 10 times more funding than they thought it would. Um, and it only provide, I shouldn't say only, but it provides water to these community centers. Uh, but I think most people still live rurally and remotely on the reservation. So finding ways to, um, I think, install sublines that could get more people hooked up and make the mini Wichoni pipeline a more holistic resource it was intended to be. Um, and also, I think looking at um, improving water filtration technology, low cost, low maintenance filters is something that would be incredibly valuable. I know in this, in the data set that I have, the Indian Health Service would actually provide people with a water filter if they got uh, hit above an EPA MCL threshold, but those water filters only have a limited lifetime. And I know um, it seemed like maintenance had fallen to practically 0%. So I think in terms of water scarcity and issues on the reservation, it's finding ways to develop some sort of centralized or semi-centralized infrastructure and also looking at better ways and mechanisms for water treatment. Yeah, and the long-term long, long -term maintenance of that water treatment, yeah. So uh, kind of along the similar lines, another question we have is, do you think federal funding of stream gauges and data management would be useful and or would, um, would would that a low, I'm not understanding the second part to this question, something about prior uh, infrastructure improvements. So would, would, uh, would infrastructure improvements or fund, federal funding for stream gauges and data management be useful from your perspective? 
Yeah, um, I think, you know, all of these communities tend to be incredibly data limited. So I think anything that can provide insights like a stream gauge would be valuable. Um, it's something that I'd like to see partnerships with different tribes and indigenous peoples. I think it's also um, particularly important, just given the history of unethical practices and mistrust that um, this infrastructure is actually owned and, and managed by indigenous people. So I would like to see collaborations and you know, partnerships where the USGS partners with the Oglala Sioux Tribe, the Navajo Nation, other areas, and actually works together to install this infrastructure um, in, in something that's truly collaborative and ideally owned and operated by the tribe itself. Yeah. Again, getting at that long-term relationship and long-term commitment to the projects. Um, and thinking about the life cycle of whatever equip equipment that we're using. Um, so we have a few more questions that came in. What is your opinion on students and researchers who don't have a relationship with their study area? Maybe they're working remotely. Uh, this person works with an international, work with international boundaries and is not sure how to be more invested without pestering. Um, they liked your comment about developing relationship, no matter the funding schedule. And also thank you for great insights in the talk. Yeah, I mean, I think in terms of working in places, it's you're, you're gonna naturally develop a, a relationship with it through the science that you conduct. And ideally, um, in an ideal world, you find ways to actually disseminate that knowledge back to the, the people and local stakeholders there. So that can be a long-term relationship, but I think there are ways you can reach out um, and look for local stakeholders, places to get involved without necessarily pestering. So I think um, there's no harm in making an, making an introduction. So I think that's something that there's a lot of value in. A connection to a place naturally comes through the work you do and ideally it can become more broad and meaningful back by actually interacting with the people and stakeholders that call that place home. Yeah. Yeah. So another question that came in is, could you talk a little more about how you avoid falling into the competition mindset of academia, especially with pressures of being a graduate student and funding limitations? Um, I think that's another area where I'm really grateful for my culture and what I've learned growing up. Um, generosity is one of the four core values for Lakota people. And it's something that, um, you know, I, I try to stay on the collaborative side of things. I try to work with, work with people. I try to, um, you know, help people and collaborate as much as I can and worry less about, you know, the, the milestones that I'm reaching, which can be a problem. Sometimes I say yes to too many things and get overcommitted. Uh, but it's something that I truly enjoy. I love science. I love working with other people. And I think it's a good mindset to have to try to be generous, to try to, to try to, you know, help others more than yourself. And I mean, in that process, I've learned so much and became a better scientist for it. So that's something that, yeah, just, just thankful for my culture and the way that I view academia as much more collaborative. And I think, I think that leads to a healthier space. Yeah, I would wholeheartedly agree. Uh, remembering our values and and that we we each come from you know cultures of values and and bringing those with us, I think, to our scientific spaces is is can be a really helpful practice of remembering and embodying. Um, we had another question come in that says, "Thank you, Kenny, for a great discussion." Uh, I'm also located in Golden, Colorado, and work with the USGS Rocky Mountain region. Do you have any suggestions for ways that the USGS or other organizations can support tribal community members seeking advanced science degrees to continue to add more diverse perspectives in scientific disciplines? Yeah, I think that's a fantastic question, and it's something that I think there needs to be more support, mentoring, and opportunities for Indigenous students um, from everywhere between high school students through PhD students. I think we need 
more meaningful outreach to places like the Southern Ute Reservation and Ute Mountain Reservation here in Colorado. Um, I think we need more research opportunities from people that come from community colleges or tribal colleges that might not have the capacity to support research experiences for their students. Um, I know here at Minds, my advisor, Kamini Singha, almost always supports one or two students from the UNAVCO recess program, which brings students from diverse backgrounds to a research internship, either here at Mines or Colorado um, University of Colorado Boulder. And I think those are fantastic ways to make connections, support students, and give them an experience that builds both their capacity as a scientist and community. So I think kind of all across the board, more, more efforts like that are needed. Yeah. Well, we have had a, a whole slew of fascinating questions and um, I really want to thank you for, for talking today, sharing your research, your knowledge, your background and perspective and way of knowing. Um, and uh, I want to uh, offer this opportunity. Do you want to share what, like when you'll be presenting at the Frontiers of Hydrology Conference, if you want people to come visit and learn more about your research. I'm just about to share the link of in the Frontiers Conference in the chat. <clears throat> yeah, so I'll, I might have to look up specifics, but I think I have a poster presentation Monday morning, Monday the 20th or 21st. Um, so if you're interested in learning more about what Kenny Swiftford is up to, uh, please look at the Frontiers of Hyd Hydrology uh, conference schedule and, and meet with him. Um, he's doing such important work and um, we are very thankful that you are here today. Um, mm. I'm just gonna quick go through the chat to see if I missed anything. Yeah, and I just quickly left my email in the chat in case anyone, I see a couple questions here. If anyone wants to follow up, there's my email. Feel free to reach out anytime. Okay, uh, there, here's a question. There's a branch of Utah State in Blanding, Utah. How can you get some of these students involved? There's one question. Um, I'll have to chat with, so the the community leader that I'm working with is based in Bluff, Utah. I think we might have a student from Blanding actually. Um, we kind of left it up to three community members to, that had connections to recruit these students. Um, I think we might actually have one from Blanding, but um, we actually started up, we had our first meeting in a couple weeks ago and I'll be going down there in about two weeks to teach um, some water sampling protocols and techniques. Oh, wonderful. Well, uh, I want to honor our time and we're coming to an end here um, and just respond very briefly to the question about how we can learn more about data sovereignty. Um, I know that there are CARE principles. Um, so if you look up C-A-R-E, um, that's one sort of branch of uh, the literature that you can learn. Do you have any thoughts about, uh, brief thoughts, Kenny, about uh, data sovereignty? Yeah, I think actually a lot of tribes have an um, institutional review board process for any research, regardless of, you know, you typically think of that for like a biological or human study. Um, but given, given both kind of the unethical history and the fact that um, my tribe and many tribes um, prescribe a living status to water, a lot of times even geoscience projects end up going through the IRB process. And usually as part of that, um, a lot of the agreement is that the tribe actually has ownership of the data and control basically over data and results have to be approved by the tribe before it goes through. So I think that process is great for the tribes that have it in place. And I'd like to see more work done um, on data sovereignty and kind of a, a review process for research in tribal communities um, in, to ensure that that data sovereignty is maintained. Wonderful. Well, thanks again, Kenny Swiftford. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for all the attendees um, for your interest and, and commitment to this issue, this important issue. We will be 
sending some follow-up information about sort of next steps and what uh, the DEI committee with Kwasi is gonna take out of this series. And with that, um, I will see you in two weeks. I'm gonna quick share my screen. So we're taking next week off and um, we'll pause for reflection. And on June 8th, we will be meeting with Grace Bulltail um, from the Crow Tribe. She's an assistant professor in biological systems engineering at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. So thank you all. Um, I wish you the best and uh, we will all be in touch. Thanks a lot. Great. Thanks everyone.